Good morning. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good. Woo! Excited to be here, second day. All right. So thank you all for coming to my talk today on Submission Smackdown and Raveling the Threads of the United States Postal Service Submission SMS Fishing and Fighting Back. So to start off, just going to cover a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I work full time as a red team operator. I uh, recently graduated university, uh, first, first full time job, kind of lucky with that. Um, well in university, found around $10,000 in various bug bounty programs. So that's how I got started in web application testing and various certifications, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I also recently founded a company, Phantom Security Group, with a friend of mine. So, who here, to show of hands, got one of these text messages? Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a little bit more than I expected. Uh, I expected a good amount, but um, yeah. How did this all start? It was just one of those text messages that you just saw on screen that most of you got, it seemed. Uh, and that text message was just sent to the wrong man's wife. My wife, as it so happens. And she unfortunately fell victim to this scam. And then just a few days later, I got that text message. And I'm sitting there, I'm bored. Uh, we're on winter break in between semesters and I love hacking web apps. And what did that text have in it? A link to a web app. And so they set up the web app for me. It's good to go. It's, it's like hack the box. Come on. So I loaded up that site in my browser. Um, looks pretty legit, I, I will admit. And that's actually because the, they're loading most of the resources for the site from the actual USPS.com site. And so most of the links, they just take you to the USPS official site. Um, but below this screenshot and this little red area, you can see the delivery failed you can enter your data and this is where they start, the scammers start collecting your data. And so I wanted to get in the middle, I wanted to intercept that traffic and do a little bit more digging than the simple like Firefox developer tools allowed. So I loaded up Burp Suite, um, community edition of course, I'm not rich. Um, but the first thing I did and first thing I noticed actually was that a lot of the traffic was going to a different domain, a similar one but different. And I'm just going to call this the C2 or command and control domain because for some of the kits, it was on the same server. For some of them, it wasn't. And that became my new target. And so with Burp Suite loaded up, I could see those HTTP requests. And one of the first things I noticed was WebSockets traffic. And I was like, why is there WebSockets going on? Why did they set up WebSockets just to give us a static HTML page? There's no reason to do that. But that turned out to be one of the scammers' first of many mistakes. And that's because by doing a simple path traversal, uh, you could grab any file on the system basically. So like it's just as simple as dot dot slash dot dot slash etc. You get, you, get you get the point. Um, but yeah with this path traversal, LFI, whatever you want to call it, um, I was able to read basically everything but this machine that it was on, this web application was just a bare image. There was the obviously the web application itself that they were using to collect information but nothing really else on there so no like SSH keys or other ways that you would be able to log in usually uh, with this type of vulnerability. Uh, so looking around, very little as I said, but I did find the access logs for this server. Um, some of the other servers, uh, later on, like their access logs so big you can't pull it, it just crashes the server. But this one I got lucky and I was able to actually pull down the file. And before I cover that, I'm just going to show what it, path traversal vulnerability is just so some people understand it if you don't work with web apps often. Um, but a path traversal is when a web application is configured to grab a file from the server and that file is specified through some sort of argument. So in this example the file name argument is used to grab gift.png on the left. But if there's not proper sanitiz sanitiz sanitization of user input then an attacker can just grab any file from the system. And so usually it's from, it starts in the web root directory and so you have to do some dot dot slashes to get up a few directories to the top and then grab a already known file just so you can test it out. So et cetera password in this case. So now, now that we're caught up on web application testing, uh, let's get to the access logs. So in here, uh, going to the very top, so where usually the setup process is happening for the web server, we can see that the scammers are using a tool called BT panel. Um, some people might be familiar with it. It's a uh, Chinese 
software for server administration through a web app. And that BT panel software uses PHP MyAdmin. And looking at the, you can see the IP address of the scammer accessing that PHP MyAdmin endpoint. And you can tell it's not one of those web crawlers, web scanners, because it's PHP MyAdmin underscore a long string of characters that's so random that a scanner is not going to find that. And also it's returning a 200 OK status code to that, which means it's, it actually exists. So that endpoint is real. Um, yeah, I plugged the IP into IP location then, and some of you might already know where it's from, but uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but after that, obviously just did an end map scan of uh, the web application. Just got to get some scanning started. And two open ports. Uh, 443 obviously for HTTPS, and so we need that open to access the site. And then also 21 for FTP. And that, that was kind of weird to me. Uh, FTP is slowly dying. It's 1970s, I think. Um, but I tried multiple ways to get in through here because uh, usually FTP, if it's older setup, there's various different CVEs for it. Uh, also tried brute forcing. That didn't work out. So I had to get back to the web application. And also if you look at the scan, uh, some interesting stuff you can find with the SSL certificates is that the subject alternate, alternate names it contains all the domains that are linked back to that web app. So you can just collect them that way instead of having to go look online, uh, find different scammers. But this all links back to this IP address, this web application here. But this was interesting information. It wasn't an RCE or anything I was looking for, like SQL injection or something like that. I, w I, I wanted to take over this app. I didn't want to get information disclosure. So I had read access to the file system, the path traversal, I had a bunch of different domain names linked back to the web app, and I had, to fi I had figured out like a little bit about how the back end works with that path traversal vulnerability. But I didn't really have any admin data besides the IPs access and the access logs, um, and no victim data at all. I didn't know who was being scammed exactly, general guess just of who it was. But I had to dig deeper and try harder as offsec might say. Don't kill me for saying that. Um, yeah, so I, I did just that, try it harder. Uh, and this led to a breakthrough. And still going to cover it up because I uh, don't want to reveal which endpoint is vulnerable to this. But it was a blind, unauthenticated, time based SQL injection vulnerability, which in short is a really slow dump of a database. Uh, very, very slow. And the way I was able to find this is just simple single quotation in the argument and it returned a 200 OK status code, not like a 500 error, which would, what you would expect. But in the message returned, it said error, um, which none of the other responses did uh, when you insert a colon in there, or colon, single quote, whatever you're testing with. So yeah, dumped the database for that domain. Uh, some interesting tables in there. Dumped some of the contents of those tables. And looking at those tables, config was actually surprisingly boring. Uh, most of the data in there was just what type of credit cards are you taking in, an activation key for the kit itself, uh, some other things like that. User info and records were encrypted blobs, so I tried dumping them and no luck. Uh, it just doesn't work with time-based blind injections. It, very hard, very slow, and also there's a ton of data in them. And then that left us the admin table. So in the admin table, there is encrypted usernames, encrypted tokens, like session tokens, login tokens, hash passwords, looking like MD5, some permission levels, one through four, and unencrypted last login times and IP addresses for those admin users. So that was awesome. So can anyone guess the country? China. China. Yeah, China, China. You're so smart. It was China. And this IP address up here happens to be from the Shanghai region of China. Yeah, this is when I went ahead and published my first blog post. So I have two blog posts on this. The first one was published. I didn't really know it was a kit. I knew it was just a scammer site that they had set up. I didn't know there was a bunch more out there. And so I started looking through some of this data because I, I had a bunch, but 
again, I wanted to access the admin portion of the site. And so looking at one of the dumps, uh, if you noticed it earlier, there was a Telegram link in the description of one of the users. Go into that Telegram profile, you see this is WangduU0. Uh, and in his bio, it links to another Telegram channel, which has, at the time of taking a screenshot a few days ago, is over 3,700 subscribers. Excuse me. And in this Telegram channel, we can see some demo videos of this kit that they're selling, how-to posts to set up the kit, announcements of how secure the product is. I mean, it's super secure. No one's taking your victims, your account credentials, etc. And then some stuff like this. Oh, you can't hear it. There's no audio. Okay. It's got some hype up music. <laughs> so yeah, who is this? Who's, who's posting these videos? Who's making this kit? So that's that Wang Do Use Zero character that uh, we first found the link for. And so I actually got to chatting with him on Telegram. I was pretending I was a, uh, I which country I said I was. But I, I was obviously using Google Translate to talk to him, so I had to say I didn't speak Chinese and uh, all that. But got out of him that he's a current computer science student in China, at least at the time I've talked to him. Uh, it was about January time frame of this year. And so he may have graduated now, but at, at the time of talking, he was a computer science undergraduate, it seemed like. And along with him, there's some other members of the group that do graphic, de graphic design, uh, web developers, of course. Um, and I got that information from a company called RE Security. And it turns out, so when Googling the Wang Yu Zero character, uh, two blog posts from RE Security popped up. And they had already done a good amount of research on this uh, USPS submission campaign along with other campaigns that this group that they dubbed the Smission Triad uh, had done. And... Oh, okay. So, cool, thank you. Yeah, the submission triad, uh, they had found some various vulnerabilities in the USPS kit beforehand, and so they had also found a similar SQL injection vulnerability in the kit, but the author of the kit had read their blog, patched the vulnerability, started encrypting data, he also added CAPTCHAs to logins um, for admins, like a bunch of other security features. Um, but we're getting into how we bypassed all that. So, the RE Security Hunter team had mentioned in the blog that they had acquired, purchased through some means, a kit from the Smission Triad. So I'm broke. Uh, these kits cost $200 a month, and I'm I'm not paying that. Uh, <laughs> like no. So also I can't support scammers. So that's another thing. But yeah. So I I beg them. Uh, they get back to me. They're like, hey, uh, what? Can we read about what you've done? Can you tell us a little bit about what, what you're looking into? Talk back and forth, and they were kind enough to send over the kit for free. And so unzipping the kit, one of the first things I noticed was default credentials. Admin and the password of 123456. And then when you log in for the first time, you don't have to change it. So that makes it nice and easy for us. Um, and I will mention about 20% of the kits I ended up finding still had those default credentials. Uh, the thing was the hashes, so I, I, it looked like MD5, I presumed it was MD5. The MD5 hash for 123456 did not line up with what was in the pre-prepared database. And so I knew there was something going on, there was some salt being added, maybe it was some similar, similar algorithm um, that yeah, I just didn't know about. But the issue was, Looking at the code, it, it was gross. Like, it's not even human readable. Um, very highly obfuscated PHP code. In the, along with that PHP code, it was using introspection, so you can't add like echo statements in there to echo stuff out. And also, it had multiple times it was checking where, uh, checking to see if it was being debugged. And so, I just couldn't find a way. I spent multiple days trying to uh, deobfuscate. Uh, the code in there. But that's when a friend of mine, actually up here in the first row, uh, suggested using a technique called eval hooking. And so 
using simple echo statements, so you hook the eval function, which it has to be plain PHP, plain text PHP to be executed by the eval function for the page to work. So if you just hook into that function, echo out what it's executing, you can slowly figure out what's going on in the code. And so you can see some of my notes here, and the variable names are disgusting, gross. Uh, but up in the middle, there's little comments added after them. And you can see that the usernames are being encrypted with AES 128 CBC. Uh, and they're using the key of WDY 6666666, just meaning length requirements. And then the IV of AES 128 WangDU 8. Um, and so he loves using his own name in these passwords and stuff. So now the passwords were a bit trickier though. Uh, took a little bit longer to figure out. And the passwords were appended with a salt. Uh, so Wang, Du, Yu, again more sixes and then special characters. Um, and then after that they were hashed three times using MD5. The gold standard for hashing algorithms. I know it's 20, he, was, he wrote it in 2023 so like, yeah, I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's learning in school but yeah. Then also we look at the activation. Uh, so looking into the kit, I noticed that when I would ex like spin up the server, it would check its activation. And so this is some uh, base64 encoded, uh, well hex and then base64 encoded data. And he hard coded his IP address for his admin server, like right there um, in the code. So uh, that, that's his IP address. I, don't, I haven't checked recently if it's still up, but you can go say hi to him. Um, but also he was double dipping. So he's charging 200 bucks a month for this kit. He's, he, he makes tons of reassurances that he's not stealing their information. No one else is stealing their information. But every time an admin logs in, it sends their login token to him. Like, so he's, he can just log in as that user and take their victim data along with their 200 bucks a month. So no honor. But yeah, so now we have the method for hashing of the passwords. And so I go ahead and make a go tool, a little quick go tool to crack those passwords. And you can see my command line up there. Uh, it's kind of small up here, but uh, just using Rocky against the hashes and printing them out. And so you can see like one, two, three, four, five, six, obviously the default, uh, but like straight zeros, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, three, two, one, admin, three, three, admin, one. Etc. All these really easy passwords, but obviously it's rock you, so it's only going to crack the easy ones. But the issue was some of the larger panels I was finding, rock you wasn't cracking those any of those passwords for the users, and so I had to add normal uh, use password cracking techniques to crack them. So the first thing I did was rules basically, just adding suffixes to the rock you word list um, as it's going through. Uh, just appending one to the end, exclamation point, dollar sign, uh, other different symbols and number patterns that I was seeing in a lot of the passwords. And then I also need a new word list for this because they're mostly Chinese based. So uh, I needed a word list that wasn't Rock U because Rock U is English, obviously, uh, for the most part. Uh, and most other word lists are like English, French, that sort of thing. Not, there's not many. Uh, Asian word lists out there um, for a lot of Asian languages. So the one I ended up choosing was the Keonashi word list. And it was one of the only word lists I could find actually for this. And using that word list and these rules, I was able to crack over 130 of those hashes for those admin users. As so now, we have decrypted usernames, we have cracked passwords. We can just log into these panels, right? Oh, and this is like, this is the default admin like login screen. Uh, but no, you, you can't do that. Uh, the majority of those admin panels actually have wait lists set up for IP addresses. And like that, okay, that's pretty good. Um, the, luckily for us though, like some of them just didn't set it up. So we were able to test this out on a few different panels, three to be exact. And uh, you enter the username and password and solve the CAPTCHA and then you just log in. And so this is the inside of the panel, this is the main dashboard. Uh, they got nice statistics, uh, numbers, everything. Uh, and who doesn't love Excel um, or CSV formatted stuff? Um, so they had that and you could view the domain names that they were uh, scamming people from. But those restrictions on access and slash admin really 
hampered what we were able to do, or what I was able to do, because you couldn't dump any of the kits except for those three that had the whitelist not enabled. And so to bypass that, there's these endpoints that it reaches out to to authenticate, to grab victim data, to grab admin data, to list those domains that we just saw on the previous slides. Uh, and those endpoints don't have the whitelist on them. So they're, they're not protected at all. And so all I had to do was just authenticate directly to those endpoints. Um, so here I'm just authenticating and getting the login token. And here this is just accessing the data for the home panel. So overall statistics for how many fishes. So it looks like all records, this one had like 9,200 victims, it looks like. And so now using this, uh, I mean, I, Burp Suite's awesome, but I didn't want to have to do this every time I found a kit. So I automated the process, and here we'll show a little demo of it. So the capture pops up. Couldn't really find a bypass for the captcha, so had to solve it manually, unfortunately. Enter the captcha, it goes through, dumps that data for me. And so this kit that I just dumped there had 28 victims, so really small, brand new one. Uh, and then this one we're about to have is going to have over like 5,000 victims in it. Um, so here it dumps the pending victims, complete victims. So it's going to have. Uh, if you dumped over a thousand victims at one time in a page, it would crash the server. And so I would have to dump like a thousand a page and then iterate through there how many, however many pages um, it was. And so there you go, that's the recording. But like 48 pending victims and then 4,900 something completed victims. But we need more targets. So I had the automation set up. I needed a better way to get these URLs other than them just texting me because I only got a few text messages. So I crowdsourced. I set up a site for people to submit URLs to uh, and it would grab, so there's a static JavaScript config file in there and I could grab that like C2 domain uh, from that file and uh, that just makes my life easier. But also I found a bunch of URLs here. So r slash scams on Reddit. Uh, people post screenshots of their text messages. So I had to hand jam those URLs in, which is unfortunate, but it was okay. Um, but yeah, uh, just hand jam those URLs in. And one thing I also noticed when going through r slash scams, it was that there was a copycat campaign going on. And this copycat campaign was interesting to me because they had ripped the entire front end of the Smission Triads kit and just placed it on top of their back end. And you could tell they had done that because the site was reaching out to endpoints that didn't exist on this server but would exist on the Smission Triads back end. So like WebSockets for example. Like there's no need to set up WebSockets. They realized this so they didn't set up WebSockets but it's still trying to reach out to it because they just didn't even edit the JavaScript into the site. So that was interesting. Uh, didn't really end up exploiting this campaign. Uh, just targeted the Smission Triads one. But uh, something of note. So now I, I was get, gathering those URLs from different places and this was the process that I would go through. I would extract the admin panel URL uh, from that static JavaScript config file. I would exploit that time-based SQL injection uh, against that domain, uh, dump the admin table, decrypt the usernames from that, put the hashes in the cracker tool, uh, let that run for a little bit, took forever. Um, and once it was done, uh, I would hopefully have a new login that I could add to that automation script that I just showed you. So now, after doing all this, uh, got some interesting statistics. So, this is my ChatGPT generated infographic. Gra um, look at that. <laughs> uh, but it's all the times uh, data was entered. So this is times a uh, credit card was entered. So. 1.2 million times a credit card was entered into this site. So they went through the whole process, entered your credit card. The total unique credit cards though was 438,000. Um, mm -hmm. Unique IPs, 73,000. Um, unique emails used, 54,000. And then domains used by the scammers, they used uh, over 1,100 domains, uh, which is crazy. The thing is, this isn't even all the data. This is the ones I was able to find. There's more, there was more out there. Uh, they go up and down all the time, getting taken down. Uh, so it, the numbers are much larger than this probably. So now looking at those admin logins, uh, we can do a simple map of their IP addresses. 
easy way they're logging in from. And get some interesting statistics on this. You can see a lot of the publicly known proxies are coming from the United States, so they're proxying to the US. Um, so there, there are some people logging in from the US that aren't from publicly known proxies. Excuse me. Um, some in Europe, and so most of them are in China, but obviously anyone can buy this kit, so admins are going to be logging in from throughout the world. But zooming in on Asia, you can see cluster in Taiwan, you can see a cluster in, I think that's Hong Kong and Shanghai region, uh, and then also some down in Philippines and those islands. Now mapping the victims the same way. Uh, this was wild. So, yeah. I mean, it's USPS, so obviously a ton in the US, but also like a ton throughout the world. And I'm going to guess this is a combination of people testing out those random links and also tourists. So people traveling, they get those text messages and enter their data that way. Zooming in on the US, it's basically a population density map. Um, so tons over on the East Coast, obviously. Uh, gets a little thin throughout the Midwest and then SoCal and up in Washington, Oregon. Um, and also cluster out in Hawaii. So yeah, a lot of, lot of IP addresses there. More infographic. So look at the top three states. Uh, so California was number one with 141,000 victims. Texas had 119,000 and Florida had a, over 100,000. Uh, top three email domains used, uh, Google, well, Gmail was way at the top with 93,000, iCloud with 15 and Yahoo with 12. And then other stats. So the average credit cards entered, out of this 1.2 million entries, on average people entered 2.48 credit cards, so almost rounding up to three. And the reason for this was when you go through this process and you enter your credit card, it would be like, oh, this card is invalid, enter a new one. And so people would just keep entering credit cards. It, so I, I saw six credit cards for some of them, like it was crazy. Um, and so it's unfortunate, but they just, that's why unique email addresses and unique credit cards, th that was such a big difference. Also, you can see the number of .edu emails in there, so a lot of professors, staff at universities, Students, obviously, so 471 there. Uh, some people were using the dot .mil email addresses, which I was kind of surprised about. So three dot .mils in there and 17 dot .gubs, so federal employees. Um, so what happened with all this data? I had all this 1.2 million victim records here. I started looking for some help. So no one really wanted to reach back out to me though. So I, I, I reported through the uh, Internet Crime Center's like online forum and the FBI like reported tip or whatever and the postal inspectors, I emailed them and no one really reached out until the banks did. Uh, one of the major banks threat intelligence teams had like read my blog on I think like LinkedIn or something and uh, they got in touch with me, uh, set up a meeting with their team and I just walked through what I'd done and showed uh, securely the victim data with them so that they could go through, find their customers, uh, get those credit cards canceled, make sure any false charges get handled. And then they also pass it off to their network of banks. And so just that single major bank, they were able to help over 80,000 people, which is wild. Um, and then with that, they also got me in touch with the US Postal Inspector's Office. They had a contact in their cyber crimes uh, division there. And so, working with the postal inspectors, I was able to share that admin data as w along with the victim data and uh, a chat export of my conversation with Wang Du Yu because I'd gotten some interesting information from him in regards to the case that they were doing. Um, one thing that they had mentioned, so the bank along with the postal inspector's office, is that it's really hard to identi identify victims in this case because there's so many different ways your credit card can get stolen. And having this like hard evidence, I don't know if it's probably not admissible in court but having this hard link between this is where you enter your credit card and they're known for stealing your credit card. So there you go. You can just link the two together directly. Um, investigation seems to be ongoing. There's been no update. Uh, if any of you read the Wired article that was posted just a few days ago, uh, Matt Bridges uh, from Wired, he talked to the Postal Inspector's office. They still say the investigation is ongoing. And so how, do, how can we fix this issue? Um, other than man in the middle on every text message, uh, don't do that by the way. Uh, I'm not an expert in any of these fields, so SMS, iMessage, iOS, Android. Um, but I think some better client side filtering needs to be done. So obviously, I'm going to say the buzzword AI. Um, AI can actually be helpful in this, identifying, hey, 
why is USPS texting you in the first place? And secondly, why are they linking you to this site that's obviously not the USPS's official site? Um, so some third party integrations are actively doing stuff like this. So one example, um, I don't use them, this is just something I found, was Truecaller does something similar. Uh, and you can just integrate it into your, uh, in, at least iOS and I assume Android as well. Um, they'll just do that filtering for you. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, DEF CON. Uh, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm.